Unai Emery is the new manager of Aston Villa. He will be taking charge in the dugout against Manchester United this weekend. And the question on everyone's lips is, what is his Aston Villa going to look like? So here's the Aston Villa team on the board. This is how they played under Steven Gerrard. Now, the thing to notice from this system is it's very, very narrow. All of the width is coming from the fullback, so they play a really important role. It's worth saying at this point, Aston Villa could actually switch up their forward orientation. So if they wanted a more classic striker in, they could bring Ings alongside Watkins have a striker pair and then have Coutinho dropping as a 10. Uh, this is more of a 4-4-2 diamond now than a 4-3-3 as it was before. But the important thing is that, that narrowness is still there. So the idea then is to generate space for your fullbacks to run into in these areas and you're going to see those fullbacks pushing down the line. This is where you're getting a lot of your width from because as we can see, the only other wide player in a forward area is pretty much Leon Bailey. But because you're getting all of your width from the fullbacks here, you're leaving a lot of space in behind and the way that Steven Gerrard dealt with that was by the ball near central midfielder in the three just dropping into the space depending on which fullback had pushed forward. Now the problem with this was that because they were in the build-up phase often the pivot player would drop in between the two centre backs to help out in that early build-up and then what you're doing is because you're pushing forward you're leaving a huge amount of space in the midfield and so we saw Villa often attacked through that central area because of this need to get width in these two spaces. And so because of these problems, Steven Gerrard got fired. And if you want to find out more about what Steven Gerrard does in his next job, then we will no doubt be covering it on this channel. So make sure you're subscribed. There is a button below and make sure you press the bell notification button as well, because that will keep you informed as to when videos drop onto our feed. If we look across the rest of the squad in a sort of 4-3-3 situation, we can see that there's backups all over the place. So we've got lots of central defensive backups, uh, we've got right back backup, left back backup, goalkeeper backup. So everything across the back here, there's plenty to go with. And then you've got your central midfielders. So if you've got a, a, a deeper line player, you can have Nakamba coming up behind him. Douglas Luiz can play either as the pivot player or he can play as one of the eights as well. Uh, and then we've got Don, Dendonka as well, who can play pretty much across even in the back line. So plenty of backup in these sorts of areas. Now, in the forward areas, there is Danny Ings, who can play as a striker as well. We've got Coutinho and Buendia, who are both uh, creative players, can play centrally. And then there's just Leon Bailey in the wide area here, probably better off the left-hand side, but has been playing off the right. So it's a squad which is pretty good for a mid-table side. Uh, there are these weaknesses in terms of the wide areas in particular, so these might be areas that Unai Emery might want to strengthen as he goes forward. But it's a very good mid-table squad, and the good thing about Unai Emery being good with mid-table sides is he has a lot of success with mid-table sides in Spain. So this is Unai Emery's CV, I think it's the one that he actually submitted for the job that he now has. Now most people's eyes will be drawn to the Arsenal period because that is the period they remember, but what's most interesting for me is that there's a very specific flow in this CV. Unai Emery has periods at mid-table Spanish sides where he has a really good success rate. So Valencia, Sevilla, Villarreal, and obviously at Villarreal and Sevilla, that's when you get those four Europa League titles that he won. But then you have punctuating these successful periods, trips abroad, so he goes to Spartak Moscow, that goes really badly. Paris Saint-Germain is meh. And then we have Arsenal, and I think this period maybe is a little bit undervalued by a lot of people because of the first season he was there was pretty good. Um, it culminated in a Europa League final, but then it falls off very quickly there as well. So what we see with Unai Emery then is a coach who can get a lot out of mid-table sides. He is able to take a group of players and make them better than the sum of their parts. He is able to fit players into a team and get them functioning in the best way possible. And this means that against big sides, they can be quite reactive and can cause them problems, but they can also cause problems for smaller sides as well. And this is exactly what we saw from his Villarreal side. So on the board in front of me, I've got Villarreal as they played under Unai Emery in their famous 4-4-2. The thing to notice is that there's a lot of players who are in unusual positions. So Francis Coquelin, you may remember as a player who played for Arsenal in the central midfield, usually deeper. He's playing outside as a winger in this instance. We've also got Arno Janjuma, who is more likely to be playing where Coquelin is playing. He's now playing as a striker. We've got Juan Foyt, who was a centre-back for Spurs, now playing as a full-back for Villarreal. So we're already seeing that Unai Emery is bringing in players and playing them in unusual positions. The other thing we need to notice is that whilst this is a 4-4-2, this is how they are setting up defensively. So they're gonna play in a mid block, they're gonna allow players to have possession of the ball, this sort of area, they're gonna 
allow them to pass it around, but as soon as they start encroaching into certain areas, then you'll see players moving towards the ball to stop the opposition from progressing the ball any further. But actually, in possession, things look very different indeed, and this is partly why you've got players in such unusual positions, because what we would see in possession happening for Villarreal is that actually this midfield starts moving over, Coquelin's now playing more like an eight than a wide player in particular. And what this does is it opens up this channel for Estupinian in this instance, or a more aggressive fullback to get forward. So often you'll see this player playing on the same sort of line as even the front two players here, but pushing forward. Now what this does is this opens up a huge amount of space in the fullback area, and that's partially why there's a more defensively minded player in Coquelin in this area, because he can drop in and help out. But actually what Villarreal do is they like to shift their defence across, so they end up with pretty much a functional back three here, and that's why Juan Foyt is playing as the fullback on that side, because it's not just the case that he's going to be expected to get forward, he is also expected to behave almost as an outside centre-back as well. So on the other side of the midfield then, we have in this instance Jeremy Pina, but also Chigueze or Lo Celso could play here as well, and this player is expected to be a much more attacking option than obviously Coquelin on the other side. So what will happen is one of the forwards will drop off into this area to help out in the midfield, and this opens up space then for this player to get into really dangerous attacking areas as well. And obviously, because you've got Juan Foyt here, he's going to be able to cover that area a little bit better. You've also got defensive options in Capoue and Parejo as well. But Unai Emery's Villarreal also have the option of playing against teams who are going to dominate against them and still generate chances in that way. And they did that usually through the build-up phase. Now, often when teams are looking to break at speed against oppositions, uh, you'll often see them play the ball around the back and then play it long directly. And with Arno Danjuma here, who as we've already said is a little bit more of a left wing option, he is great at just running these dangerous routes in behind uh, and he's scored a lot of goals for them in that way in transitional moments. But actually the way that Unai Emery's Villarreal built up against teams who were putting them under pressure was quite interesting. We saw it against Bayern Munich in the Champions League and that was a game that they won that no one expected them to win. And what they did was actually rather than just going long and looking for space in here, what they were going to try and do is generate space in the middle and the way they did this was quite fascinating actually because what they did is they pushed their centre-backs super wide, far wider than you would expect centre-backs to be played. And what they did then is they fashioned these passing triangles in wide areas so the ball could come out here, they would play the ball around Bayern Munich or a pressing side so they would draw the players in and put them under pressure but the idea was then to get Parejo, who's a really creative passer, into space on the ball and then you can find, he can then find these these balls in behind to the strikers. So this ability to play in two different modes actually shows up really nicely in the data. On the board in front of me here, I've got some data from last season. So this is the season when they were in the Champions League. And what I've done is I've taken playstyle percentiles. So these numbers are all percentiles. So they run from zero to 100, just to show you how different Villarreal were when they played in La Liga to how they played in the Champions League. So let's take a look at a number of these different um, metrics. So non-penalty XG. So when it came to La Liga, Villarreal were in the 89th percentile for generating expected goals. That's very good. That's right near the top. In the Champions League, they were mid-table. They're around 50% in the 50 percentile. So you can see that they're generating less XG when they're playing in the Champions League. Now that makes a certain degree of sense. In terms of non-penalty XG, they're now much lower in terms of conceding XG, which is good in La Liga, and much higher in the Champions League. So there's a sense in which the bigger competition meant that they were going to be performing worse. But when we start looking at some of the playstyle uh, metrics here, we can start seeing slightly different things. So in La Liga, 84th percentile for possession, which is obviously very high, versus 27th percentile for possession in the Champions League. Now, that means that in La Liga, they're going to be holding the ball in those more advanced areas, they're going to be working out how to break down oppositions, whereas in the Champions League, as we saw, they were sitting deep, they were looking at ways to build up, find Danny Parejo, and then get the ball forward quickly. Now, field tilt is a metric which looks at how many touches you have in the final third versus your opponent. And so again, in La Liga, you can see they're putting up much more touches than their opponent in the final third, and that reverses in the Champions League. Directness, however, is the other way around. They're much less direct in La Liga, much more direct in the Champions League. And then in terms of high pressing, 
in La Liga, they are much more likely to press in those high areas than they are in the Champions League. They're down in the seventh percentile here. So what we're seeing from Unai Emery is a coach who is able to set his team up in quite a reactive way. They can play in a defensive mode. They can also play in an attacking mode. And the determinant between those two modes is going to be the opponent that they're facing. So this all raises the question, what are Aston Villa going to look like under Unai Emery? So let's imagine what Aston Villa might look like if they played the same way that Unai Emery's Villarreal played like. So on the board, in front of me, I've just speculated as to how this might look. So Likudinia is an aggressive fullback, so we already have the ability for width to come down this side, and we can then see the midfield shift across. McGinn is a hard-working, creative player who can get forward as well, so he would fit in the Coquelin role quite nicely, I think. But with Dean pushing forward, you then have your back three shifting across. Now, we already have a problem here because Matty Cash is not like Juan Foyt. You might want a player who is a little bit more like an outside centre-back here. There are other options available as well, but this would raise a question about how you're going to fit Matty Cash into this team if you're playing aggressively on one side and that's the side that he's not on. This brings us to the central midfield options and this is where there's a little bit of a question mark. Actually, I'm going to draw a question mark on the board because I can. Because at Villarreal there was two players. We had Danny Parejo who's a very creative uh, progressive passer and then Etienne Capoue who is a bit more of a defensive midfielder. Now both Kamara and Douglas Ruiz are very defensively minded. Both of them are decent progressive passers but that dynamic is very different to the one at Villarreal where you have a super creative player and then more of a super defensive player. So this might be an area where Unai Emery might have to strengthen if he wants to play the same way that he played with his Villarreal. And then up front, we've got actually the perfect player in Ollie Watkins because Ollie Watkins, like Arno Danjuma, is a player who has played wide in his time and loves to make those sorts of runs in behind direct towards the goal. And then we have potentially a number of players who could play the other role. So Danny Ings, if you want a more classic sort of striker, but also someone like Emi Buendia, who is going to be able to play that that dropping role quite well as well. So if Unai Emery wants to play the exact same system that he played at Villarreal at Aston Villa, then he does have the players to do that. There are some areas where there's not great fits, but he has got a January transfer window coming up. So on paper, Aston Villa are actually a really good side for Unai Emery to coach. They've got a really good squad. They're a mid-table side and they're looking to push up the season and he's got plenty of experience of doing just that. So the Villa fans should be quietly confident that they've got a really good coach in Unai Emery and it'll be really interesting to see how he gets them playing in the Premier League. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including David Ornstein, Daniel Taylor, Ollie Kay, Amy Lawrence and Rafa Honigstein. There are journalists dedicated to each Premier League team, so every fan gets the coverage they deserve, not just the big clubs. And you can try it for free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.